Great. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, today I will be talking about topic modeling using latent derelict allocation. Um, my name is Alyssa Wissa. I'll give you a little blurb about me before I dive into um, the talk today. So currently I am a product analyst at Square. In my current role, I'm responsible for using data science and various analytic tools to help inform the product on how to move, <coughs> why to move, and where to move. Um, essentially, yeah. Um, previously, I worked in growth analytics at a startup called Order Ahead, um, and I was doing a lot of growth hacking work um, and helping with growth and retention um, for that startup before. And before that, I was doing merger and acquisition work in Singapore for a few years. Um, so, pretty diverse background. Um, I have a bachelor's and a master's in psychology from Stanford. Um, and if you ever have any questions about anything that I covered today in the talk, or you just want to talk to me about all things data, because data's kind of cool, um, feel free to email me at awisdom at squareup.com. Make it pretty easy. Um, yeah. Cool. All right, so for the talk today, um, it's going to be a little bit of theory, a little bit of application. Uh, I think theory is important to cover. So we're going to be talking about just machine learning, base, um, basic machine learning concepts. Um, topic modeling and how it fits into the machine learning framework. Um, latent derelict allocation, um, which is the major topic modeling method that I'll be diving into today, and different model evaluation metrics that you can use to make sure your model's doing what you actually want it to do. Um, and then for the second half of the talk, I'll be showing you different applications. Um, so talking about the Python libraries that you can use um, to do latent derelict allocation um, and showing you an example. Um, with some Python code. Okay. So we'll start with machine learning. So how many people have seen something along the lines of this before? Yeah, okay. So I mean, whether you're a consumer or you're working in a company, um, we've all seen something pretty similar, right? When we unsubscribe from a product. Um, this is a free text field which um, we show users to kind of gauge why they're leaving the product. Some companies use categories instead of free text, um, and you know these categories are usually based in some type of intuition or maybe past user feedback. Um, some of the pros of having set categories for users to choose from is that it's really easy to understand trends, right? The product manager can just kind of look through it, see how many people chose which reason, and figure that's the top reason. Um, but one of the drawbacks of um, having preset categories is that it's really, they're really confining and they don't, they're very slow to evolve with the customer. So um, that's why a lot of companies like Square use free text fields such as this. Um, the upside to it is that you get a lot of, um, a lot of rich text qualitative data, um, but the downside is that it can be really difficult to parse. So my PM came to me one day and he said, hey Alyssa, um, you know, we've been looking at the funnel as we always do um, with SaaS products looking at how we could um, either increase acquisition or decrease churn. Um, and he said, I wanted to look into retention. And we have all of these churn reasons, and I don't want to parse through all that in Excel, slash don't really know how. Um, so can you help me? And the first thing that came to mind was, OK, this probably calls for some type of machine learning solution using topic modeling. OK, so first let's talk about the world of machine learning um, and how topic, topic modeling fits into this framework. Um, the way that I see machine learning is that there are tons of options and applications at your fingertips for you to use, and depending on what kind of data you're working with, you really choose the best application that meets your data needs. Um, there are two major groups of machine learning applications, um, which is supervised and unsupervised learning. This is essentially determined by whether or not your data set does or does not contain labeled target output values. In supervised learning, um, you have a set of inputs usually a vector or numerical representation of features of some sort, um, with corresponding target output values, also known as the supervisory signal. Supervised learning algorithms analyze and they learn from a lot of training data, and they produce an inferred function, which you can use for mapping unseen inputs to their corresponding target values. Um, if the targets are categorized into classes, then it's a classification problem. Um, if the target is continuous or quantitative, then it can be a regression problem. Um, in unsupervised learning, though, you only have a set of inputs with no corresponding target value. So essentially, you're training your machine to learn from the inputs and figure out the latent or the hidden structure and relationship between the various inputs. It's really good for exploratory analysis and, under, and really understanding how things are related. 
Supervised and unsupervised learning um, have different use cases depending on um, what problem you want to solve. So let's say um, you're a major track and field fan, which I am. How many people like track and field? Okay, okay, we have some, some track and field fans here. That's great. Um, and let's say you wanted to create a model that could predict who would win the men's 100 meter dash, right? In 2016 Rio Olympics. You would probably look at the past five years of world championship data for the 100 meter dash and take the names of the competitors as the inputs. Um, and the binary outcome of the competition, which would be win or lose, would be the outputs in your, to train your model. Based on the training data, you would probably likely learn that Usain Bolt, one of the most successful track and field athletes in the history of the sport, has a track record of winning and would pre probably predict for him to win. You wouldn't be wrong. Um, now let's take, um, or let's say that you're Fitz Coleman, who's a director, of head, director and head coach of Jamaica's national track and field team, who helped usher Usain into his professional career. If Coach Coleman wanted to better understand what three major characteristics went into making an elite athlete um, to better guide and develop his athletes like Usain, he could do this with unsupervised learning um, by looking at the characteristics of major accomplished athletes and let's say in the past 10 years or so, um, such as like weight, height, hours practice, athletic performance stats, etc. cetera. Um, he then used these stats as inputs um, for a clustering model, which would tell him something along the lines that these characteristics indicating natural ability, maybe work ethic, and mental fortitude are the major pillars of accomplished athletes or elite athletes. So we group those characteristics into three groups if that's um, the, the amount of cuts that he wanted. Okay. So based on this, um, what kind of, uh, I guess for everyone, I'm not quite sure if everyone is familiar with topic modeling or not, but if you're not familiar, um, what kind of machine learning application do you think topic modeling is based on those examples for the people not familiar with it? Anyway, just call it up. Unsupervised. Unsupervised, right. So topic modeling is a, um, is a type of unsupervised um, machine learning that makes us makes use of clustering and looking for latent variables or hidden um, structures in your data set. Um, one type of topic modeling that I prefer to use is latent like allocation, not to be confused with linear discriminant analysis, which has the same exact <laughs> um, acronym. And I mean, for everyone who um, uses Python, when you're looking through like scikit-learn um, for different libraries that you can use, um, LDA, is a, um, LDA is something that is there. Don't use linear discriminant analysis. Make sure you are very um, mindful of that. I've seen a lot of threads where that's gone wrong <laughs> um, on a number of occasions. So, yeah. Um, the real LDA, as I like to call it, is um, a generative statistical topic model um, for finding accurate mixtures of topics with the given document set or within a different, given document set. Um, and just. You know, this isn't meant to be an exhaustive list of all the major algorithms that you can use. Um, you can definitely uh, look online. I included a link to, um, there was a cheat sheet that Microsoft has for choosing um, machine learning algorithms for your reference, or you can use anything that you want. Um, but this is just to kind of give you a sense of where topic modeling falls in this realm. Okay. And just as a note, um, because uh, LDA makes use of clustering and latent variable um, structures, if you're not familiar with that, um, clustering is there to reduce the number of examples in, um, into cluster, and um, pretty much it generally depends on some sort of distance measure, right? Um, so points near each other are normally within the same cluster, um, and points far apart from each other are normally in different clusters. Um, and the reason why a lot of times it's paired with um, dimensionality reduction is because in high dimensional space, distance measures don't really work very well. Um, so you reduce the number of dimensions first so that you can um, that it, so that your distance metric can make more sense. And also for the scikit learn users, um, today I'll be um, using a Jensen or a Jensen um, application of LDA. Um, scikit learn does have a package, um, and they have an example of topic extraction using non-negative matrix factorization um, that's powered by LDA that I encourage you to look at. Um, but I will be using Jensen. So that's that for Cool. Alright, um, so next we'll talk about topic modeling, now that we know where it falls in the world of machine learning. Um, topic modeling is a statistical model for discovering the abstract topics that occur in a collection of data. Uh, a collection of data. It is an unsupervised learning approach for finding topics in large portions of text. 
Um, and it's really great for document clustering, which I just talked about a bit earlier, um, information retrieval, and for feature selection. What it is not is not text mining. Um, so it's not just kind of finding regular expressions or um, uh, dictionary-based keyword searches. It, it kind of does a bit more than that, which um, we'll talk about as I dive into it. Some of the more popular use cases of po um, topic modeling in current day, uh, for all you marketing analysts um, or data scientists out there, um, SEO keywords. Um, to combat like keyword hacking um, based in simple keyword matching, a lot of search engines now use some form of topic modeling to um, look for content and uh, relevance. Um, there's also a pretty popular New York Times article trending um, and how they use topic modeling techniques such as Lee and Derlich allocation um, for their recommendation ending um, engine along with like a collaborative topic modeling um, that takes signals from other readers into account. Cool. So um, I think it's important to talk about um, a couple of information retrieval methods and some of their pros and cons um, and how LDA kind of built to solve all of those, or how each of them built on top of each other. Um, yeah, so TF IDF, um, you'll hear that often. And pretty much it looks for how frequently a term appears in the document suitably normalized. Um, this is also known as the term frequency, which is where the TF comes from, compared to how frequently the term appears in the corpus overall, um, which is also known as the inverse document frequency, or IDF. Essentially, if a word appears frequently in a document, it's deemed as important and scaled up in score. Um, and if a word appears frequently in many of the documents, um, common words like the or and and or a, uh, um, then it is kind of scaled down in space. Um, TF-IDF uses the bag of words method and it breaks down a document into basic word components. Um, and I'll go over that a bit later too. Um, from that, you can then count uh, frequency to characterize the text. So, um, there's some really cool pros about TF-IDF. Um, you know, it's really great for lexical or word level analysis, um, identifying most descriptive terms in a document. Um, but some of the cons are that it doesn't really take into account semantics very well, um, or the meaning of the text, and there's very little com um, compression of a corpus um, or dimensionality reduction, and it reveals little, little of the inter and intra document um, statistical structure. Okay. Um, one step further, so after TF-IDF, latent semantic in indexing, or LSI, um, it takes TF-IDF one step further um, by capturing linear combinations of TF-IDF features um, and using singular value um, decomposition to perform dimensionality reduction on TF-IDF words um, or vectors and capture most of the corpus variants. Some of the um, pros of latent semantic indexing um, is that it achieves significant compression of large um, of large collections? So it um, yeah, so it achieves significant compression of large collections um, thanks to the way that it captures um, the linear combinations, and it can also capture things like synonyms and polysemy. Um, and polysemy is just pretty much like um, when a word changes depending on the context um, of the words that it's it's with. Um, so how like uh, I think I was talking um, to Alexi earlier. And, we were saying, you know, bank, um, or whether you could bank on it, or a bank account, and things like that. So, um, yeah. Um, but some of the cons were, um, or some of the cons are that singular value um, decomposition is very computationally expensive. Um, and it usually needs to be combined with TF IDF, and it can't quite operate on its own. Um, and latent semantic. Um, Latent semantic indexing um, was kind of something that I talked about earlier with the SEO um, hacking, and it came as a solution to people trying to cheat search engines by cramming meta keyword description tags full of hundreds of keywords, um, page contents full of nothing more than random keywords and no subject related matter or worthwhile content. Um, so you'll find a lot of um, data and just studies on that online. So PL, PLSI, or probabilistic um, latent semantic indexing, uh, allows um, several topics per document in various proportions, um, so that each word will get its own topic drawn from the multinomial distribution unique to the document. Um, sometimes you'll also see probabilistic latent semantic indexing, um, or PLSI, PLSI, referred to as PLSA. Um, same thing. Uh, yeah. So some of the pros of PLSI is that 
it's a lot more expressive than the um, regular uh, latent semantic indexing. And it's really useful um, step towards probabilistic modeling of a text. So it tries to take what the, some of the shortcomings of TF, um, IDF, and of uh, latent semantic indexing um, to the next level. Um, but some of the cons is that the, general, the generative semantics of PLSI are not fully consistent, um, which leads to some problems in assigning probability to previously unobserved um, documents. So because it's not generative, it's difficult to provide an accurate probability to a document outside of the training set without retraining the, the whole model again. Okay. And another um, con is that too many parameters can sometimes lead to overfitting. Um, so the number of parameters grows linearly with the corpus size in PLSI um, and, the, and the number of training documents. Um, so this can sometimes lead to overfitting. Um, Cool. So now for the topic model of the hour, um, latent derelict allocation. So LDA assumes documents are produced from a mixture of topics. Um, those topics then generate words based on their probability distribution. Given a data set of documents, LDA backtracks and tries to figure out what, the, what, what topics would create those documents in the first place. LDA is also a probabilistic model, which possesses consistent generative semantics and overcomes some of the perceived shortcomings of PLSI. Um, derelict distribution is just because um, I know I get a lot of questions about derelict. Who's derelict? Um, but derelict distribution is a probability distribution um, over the space of multinomial distributions. Um, uh, pretty much the sparse derelict prior um, um, builds intuition into the LDA model that the document um, only covers a small set of topics that use a small set of words frequently. Um, and this results in better disambiguation of words um, and more precise assignments of document topics, um, which is why a lot of people like LDA in general. Okay. Um, the derelict, like I said, the derelict prior in LDA can therefore be interpreted as a regularization method, like L1 normalization, um, or like, and L L1 normalization is pretty much taking the absolute deviations or errors, um, and it ba basically minimizes the sum of the absolute differences between um, the target value and the estimated value. Um, another L1, um, uh, regularization technique uh, that some people might be familiar with is the lasso method as well. Okay. Mm. LDA also overcomes the um, overfitting problem by treating the topic mixture weights as um, a K parameter and K, we'll talk about like what some of these, um, I guess, variables mean um, in the next slide when I go over some of the plate notation. Um, but K is pretty much talking about or referring to topics. Um, but it takes a, treats the topic mixture weights as a key parameter hidden random variable um, rather than a large set of individual parameters explicitly linked to the training set. Um, LDA is a generalization of the PLSI um, and generative in the sense that it can give a probability to a document outside of the training set. Um, yeah, and unlike other derelict multinomial clustering models, um, LDA does not restrict a document to being associated with a single topic which depending on what you're analyzing or how you want to use um, the data, that can be really useful. Um, so one of the examples um, that I'm going to go over a little bit later is what I brought up before, the churn reasons, right? And so there's a couple different ways that you can think about churn. Um, you can take this rich free text data and you can try and um, assign one topic to it um, and you know, categorize it that way. Or if you want to get a general understanding of the entire corpus, you can see like for each um, churn reason, what are the top three topics that are um, that come up in this churn reason, and then kind of average it over the corpus to kind of understand like throughout the whole corpus, what are some of our top um, top topics and top things that people are writing about. Because sometimes, as we often realize, if someone says, let's say I'm leaving the product because, um, you know, I for the, for the price of X amount per month, um, I really would like this feature and X, Y, and Z. And so sometimes it can be cost in combination with like a feature request. Um, and you can categorize it into one or the other, but sometimes knowing both is, is helpful depending on what the product wants. Um, so it's really cool that LDA has that flexibility. Cool. So this is the plate notation I was talking about earlier. Um, this, uh, a lot of times we use plate notation to visualize what's actually going on behind the scenes of LDA and um, how the main variables um, or the many variables are related. 
Um, so in here, the boxes are plates or representations. Um, the outer plate represents um, the document and the inner plate represents the repeated choice of topics within a document um, or topics and words within a document. The big M represents the number of documents and um, the big N represents the number of words in a document and K refers to topics. So this is really important to understand because when I um, start going through, I guess, the walkthrough um, or the Python walkthrough through of LDA, you really need to know what these parameters are if you're going to tweak it. Um, as is every um, classifier, you can always, um, they will always be default um, settings for like alpha and beta, but the more you get to kind of understand these parameters and like how they can affect the model, the, the more you can kind of like tweak your model to, um, to better fit um, the data. Okay? So alpha and beta concentrations, um, alpha is a parameter of a direct prior on the per document um, topic distributions, and beta is the parameter on the per topic word distribution. Um, Alpha and beta uh, concentrations are parameters in the model that you can really tweak if you have some domain knowledge, um, in particular, especially about the, um, the model and the product um, or the data that you're working with. So the higher the value of alpha, the more topics um, documents um, are composed of, and the lower the value of alpha, the fewer topics. Um, on the other hand, for beta, um, adjusting it, if you adjust beta to, um, or the higher the beta, the more words in the corpus that um, the topics are composed of, and with lower values of beta, um, fewer words. So, just kind of keeping that in mind. Um, and so if you look at this, um, you see here that beta is the topic distribution for document M, and barfi is the word distribution for topic K. So if you're looking at this plate notation, you can kind of see the, the outer, <laughs> Um, alpha and beta um, are the parameters. The inner beta and bar phi are vectors storing parameters over, um, uh, or parameters of the zero distributions. Um, in LDA, words are the only non-latent variables uh, that are observable. So everything else is hidden. Um, and as aforementioned, as aforementioned um, a sparse deal with prior, um, which usually equates to like alpha being less than one, um, is put over the topic word distribution, which um, codes the intuition that the probability of topics is focused on a small set of words. Great. Um, so we're almost through the theory. I know it's really dense, but I think it's really important to understand um, before I jump into the code and kind of show you how this comes to life. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is model evaluation metrics. Um, and there's just like a couple of different ways that you can um, evaluate your model and just make sure that it's measuring um, what you actually want it to measure and um, that it's giving you output that you can make sense of. So one way um, or a popular way to kind of like try and measure the output of your model is using the human in the loop. Um, so you'll, this normally includes like a word intrusion or a topic intrusion, and that's pretty much when you, let's say that price and feature are the topics of these, these um, or are the topics and cost, pay, money, support, iOS, Android, scheduling, annual, are words that fall into these topics, right? Um, with word intrusion, you would swap a word in one topic with another, and if a human or a person um, can find the intruder, um, or the intruder word, then the topic is dead. So like for here, for instance, under price would be cost, pay, money, and then support. Um, support here is the intrusion, um, intruder word, um, and hopefully if the topic is strong enough, um, you can pretty easily um, tell that. Okay. And you can do the same concept with topic intrusion. Um, but sometimes even a loop can be really costly because you have to actually have people. Um, so there's other ways that you can um, evaluate your um, your model. Um, so the other way is cosine similarity, and pretty much um, this is calculating the similarity between different documents by computing the intradistance and interdistance between vector space, um, and it assumes that topics are spread evenly. Um, so if the scores, um, so you know that like a topic is good if um, it has like similar scores, um, if it has unrelated scores or opposite scores, um, and you can kind of use that to guide um, how your topics are doing and. And, and how your model is performing. A third model evaluation metric um, is predicted perplexity. Um, so pretty much algebraically, this is algebraically equivalent to the inverse of the geometric um, mean per word likelihood. Um, and a lower perplexity score indicates better generalization performance. So you're trying to optimize um, your model um, over this, and this is kind of a way that some people um, 
have figured that they want to choose their topics or if they can't really decide how many topics they want um, to split their corpus into, um, this is a good visualization that helps you with that. All right, um, great. Um, so now I'm just going to dive into some Python libraries um, that I'm going to be using in my walkthrough. Um, um, so yeah, just to familiarize um, you, this is, these are some of the Python libraries that I'm going to be um, using. Um, NLTK is a natural language toolkit for Python. Um, it's a really useful package for any natural language uh, processing, as Antonio will probably tell you when he um, gives this talk as well. Um, there's also StopWords, which is a Python package containing StopWords. And StopWords is pretty much, um, remember how I was saying there's words that really don't add meaning to a sentence like the, uh, or, New York, uh, no, no. Most stop words will probably remove that. Um, so stop words packages um, or package will kind of like take those words out. Um, and then Jensen, which is a topic modeling package that contains um, our LDA model. Okay, that's that order. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, all right, so a couple of um, major um, things that I'm doing in my walkthrough that I want to kind of just go over now so that I can breeze through what I'm showing you. Um, but one of the major things, um, there's a bunch of common steps in most natural language um, processing methods. Um, and the first is tokenization. And tokenization pretty much segments the document into its atomic um, elements. So say you have, I went to the mall. Um, it's com that sentence is composed of a bunch of different words. And so tokenization will um, split that sentence into a token or each word. Um, and yeah. So in this case, we're interested in tokenizing words. Um, and we're going to use NLTK's um, tokenize um, regular expression module to match any word characters until it reach, reaches a non-word character, like a space. Um, there are some downsides to tokenization, and there's some like workarounds for it. Things, you get like interesting things, and you'll see in the output like um, T. Um, and you'll get T because when you're tokenizing, it'll like split like a contraction, for instance, because a apostrophe is a non-word character, so then you'll get D-O-N and then T. Um, and that's just something that you'll just have to be aware of. It's kind of, it's annoying visually, um, visually and there are ways to work around it, but it's something you should be aware of. Um, stop words, like I said, so um, certain parts of the English speech, like um, conjunctions, like for or, or the word the, are meaningless to a topic model. Um, so these terms are called stop words and should probably be removed from our token list. Um, we use the stop words package from PyPy in my tutorial, um, and it's relatively a conservative, or it's a relatively conservative list. Um, there's a lot of different stop words packages that you can use, um, so I'd for you to explore. And then um, the last major um, preprocessing that I do is stemming. And so I think stemming is pretty important um, because stemming words is, is another common uh, natural language processing technique um, to reduce topically similar words to their root. Um, for example, stemming, stemmer, stemmed, um, will all be re reduced to stem. Um, and this can be important for some topic models because um, sometimes they would otherwise view these terms as separate entities, um, and that could possibly reduce their importance um, in the model. So I found that by, doing, by stemming, it helped to um, improve the accuracy and relevance of my to topics. Cool. And the last thing I want to talk about is document term matrix. So pretty much all the text documents um, combined is known as a corpus. Um, just so if I'm saying corpus, what is a corpus? Now you know. Um, to run any mathematical model on, text, on a text corpus, it's a good practice to convert it into a matrix representation. Um, so LDA, the LDA model looks for repeating terms um, or term patterns in the entire document term matrix. And to do that, we need to convert our corpus into um, a document term matrix using Jensen. Um, so the, the corporate module assigns a unique integer ID to each unique token, while also collecting word counts and relevant statistics. Um, so like I said, the other ones kind of um, reduce the words to um, give a token, so it's probably was accu uh, accuracy. And um, based on stemming, it reduced it down to Acura, so it can get accurate, accuracy, accu, whatever else you can make that word. Um, and then it assigned it an ID of 657. So that it, it links a word to an ID um, in, in the document term. Uh, okay. Cool. So 
those Python libraries. Um, now I'm going to show you an, ex um, an example of using LDA and how I used it um, in my role to help analyze Okay, cool. Um, so, give me a set. It would be easy if I could actually see the screen. It's funny because they say um, they say AI is uh, AI is easy and AV is hard. <laughs> Just trying to let's see. Give me one sec. All right. Um, so this is um, pretty much um, a breakdown of kind of how I put everything into practice. Um, this is kind of going over some of the things I talked about earlier, so I'll kind of breeze through it. Um, but this is just importing the packages that we're going to use. Um, I import the documents um, and essentially um, wrap uh, my SQL code that extracts the um, documents from our database in Python. Um, I do a bit of cleaning and pre-processing um, just because um, for some of the sure reasons, they're like automatically generated um, within our um, company and like knowing our product, I know that some of them aren't very useful so I don't necessarily need a topic for them if they're automatically generated. I'm looking for... Oh, I'm look, yeah? Can you use the font size? Yeah, for sure. Um, give me one sec. Is this better? Yeah. 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 A lot better? Cool. All right. Um, so yeah, so some of the cleaning that I did up top was just um, kind of understanding what's automatically generated and what I actually care about. Um, so, and don't, don't worry about, I guess, taking pictures. I'll, I'll send out a link. Um, to one of the organizers with the presentation so that you can have this on file. And the snippets of the Python code are um, in the presentation as well. Cool, so after I um, cleaned up um, my data set, I put it in, um, transformed it to a list uh, so that I could better feed it in later. Did the tokenization, stop words and stemming that we talked about. Um, use quarter center. Um, created this loop, um, essentially from that, um, created a loop to feed um, every, or feed my um, data documents through, so it just created a loop to tokenize, remove the stop words, um, send the words, and then add the tokens to the list here. Cool. Um, and then after that, I constructed the document term matrix. Um, so like we talked about, um, the corporate, corporate module um, assigns like a unique integer ID um, to each unique um, token, while also collecting word counts and relevant statistics like I um, discussed. Um, and then it, it, our dictionary um, has to be converted into a, a bag of words. Um, so it goes through this. Great. And so the next step after you um, kind of do everything that you need to do from a natural language um, processing perspective, um, now you have to create an object for the LDA model and train it on the document term matrix. Um, the training requires a few parameters as inputs which are explained below um, and we're using the Jensen module. Um, so some of the parameters that you must input um, is one, the number of, top number of topics. Um, so just like clusters, you have to kind of tell it how many splits you want or like how um, you have to tell it something. Um, it just can't do it automatically. Um, so same with um, LDA, you have to tell it how many topics that you want to give it. Um, me being a product analyst, I have kind of an intuition um, of the product, and so I kind of know that maybe there probably will be 15 major <coughs> topics that I'm interested in. Um, started from there, I actually think I started from 20, and I kind of like dwindled it down to something um, until all the topics seem meaty enough um, and relevant enough to us and our product product to be able to, to understand and to use in a business setting. Um, another thing that you'll need is the ID to Word. Um, so the LDEA model requires um, the previous dictionary to, to map IDs to string. Um, so that's where the, doc the document term matrix comes in. Um, and um, pretty much uh, the ID to Word would be the dictionary that we define that maps, um, like for instance, accuracy is 657, um, just so that it knows how to map whatever new document it gets. And then the corpus would be the, the, cor the new corpus of document um, uh, that you want to 
chain, um, run and chain your um, model on. And then passes. So passes are optional. Um, they, they're not necessarily required to make this thing run. Um, but um, the number of laps the model will take through the corpus um, is pretty much the passes. And the greater the number of the passes, the more accurate the model will be. Um, a lot of passes, though, can really slow down things um, on a very large corpus. So just be aware of that. Um, it's kind of similar to like some of the, it's like cross-validation and how, like, depending on the splits, you know, take forever to run. Um, so just keep that in mind. And there's a lot of other things that um, are included in your parameters that you can change. Um, like I said, there's the hyperparameters of alpha and beta that you can um, change. Um, and if you look in the Jensen model or the De Jensen documentation, uh, I know it's close to paint. Uh, but if you look in the Jensen documentation, it kind of tells you what some of the um, default settings are. Um, uh, and if you want to play around with them, like alpha, I think it's symmetric, you can make it um, unsymmetric and a couple of other different um, tweaks to it. Um, so you can play around with that and see how it improves your model. Cool. All right, um, so after all that, now we have, um, it is trained and it is ready to go. So now we can review um, the topics below. Um, so pretty much um, I wanted to view 15 topics and for each topic I wanted to see what are the top three words associated with that topic. Um, so the, what you're seeing here is each parentheses is a topic with individual topic terms and weight. So for instance, this is topic zero. Um, and use, will, and current um, are some of the top words um, that are found in that topic and et cetera. Um, it's uh, adjusting the model's number of topics um, and passes is important to really get a good result and, excuse me, eliminating confusing topics. And um, because like sometimes viewing in, in this space can sometimes be a bit dense and very hard to visualize, um, luckily LDA has something called Paul Davis, um, which is a really cool tool to visualize the fit of the LDA topic model to our original purpose. Um, so pretty much um, if you pass it through, put your model, you put the corpus, and you put the dictionary, um, and you visualize the data. And Paul Davis gives you this really cool visualization of um, pretty much the output of the topic model, or the fruit of your labor, um, one can say. So these are the um, 15 topics that I defined um, based on our uh, model. And essentially, the larger the bubble um, is kind of like the larger the, or the medium of the topic, the smaller one, um, or smaller the bubble is kind of like the smaller the topic. Um, what you're seeing here, um, to the right at least, is um, some of the most relevant terms for topics. So for instance, topic number two, um, you'll see terms like service, just, use, think, time. Um, and this may not necessarily make sense to, um, to you, but um, knowing my product and knowing um, some of the things about it, I, I can tell what topic this is and know how to categorize this and know how to kind of inform my PM on, on how he should um, proceed with um, analyzing terms and um, that kind of fall within this. Um, just so that um, it's clear as to what you're seeing here, um, the blue bar is the overall term frequency and the red bar is the estimated term frequency within a selected topic. Um, you have like a, a lambda bar where you can like slide to adjust the relevance. Um, normally a sweet spot is anywhere between 0.5 and 0.6 and really with the relevance um, the relevance metric is pretty much saying one shows the most popular corpus-wide terms um, and zero shows the most distinct terms to each topic. Because remember, LDA is looking at topic to word and topic, topic to um, documents. Um, and so you try to find a happy medium in between. Um, and you can adjust accordingly. So um, this is, yeah, this is kind of like the output of LDA. And I mean, if you want to see it, like the way, there, was a, there are a couple of different ways that we applied it. Um, but um, essentially, one way was to look at the top um, or the top predictor. Um, so for each document, and in this case, the document would be the term reason, there were a couple of different topics that were defined in it. And what I did is I took the topic with the greatest probability and just assigned it to that term reason so that we can tell this term reason is in topic two. Um, so I didn't know why I was built. So that's probably like an accidental build like billing, which is topic two. Um, one of the cancel subscription, um, um, too expensive, um, which would be topic five, et cetera. 
Um, there were other ways that um, we kind of explored this data. So we looked at, you know, for each um, term reason, what were the mix of topics, or the top three topics. Um, and then we looked at um, the, we kind of like averaged it over the, the whole corpus so that we can kind of understand. Um, okay, we don't need one term reason to necessarily be one topic. We want to see, in general, what are people talking about? What are they concerned about? And if, if a term reason includes like a couple different topics, we want to know about that too. Um, so yeah, this is, this is LDA. Um, yeah, uh, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, how much data do you typically need to do your uh, topic model? That's a good question. Um, so, I mean, of course, like, question? pardon? Could you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. Um, so the question was, how much data do you need to have um, a good topic model? And um, of course, like with every um, every input and output, the more the better. Um, you need a sufficient amount to be able to for your your, your model to make sense of it. Um, and it really depends on how meaty your documents are. So for this. My documents aren't really that meaty. Some of them are. Some people really like to write a lot, so they <laughs> write like paragraphs, you know. And I don't, I don't know if we have a, a word limit. Maybe 255 characters, standard. Um, but yeah. But for some um, some use cases of LDA, like New York Times, for instance, like their document is a whole, you know, article, um, and so it'll be a lot meatier. Um, and so I think you just have to understand um, how robust each of your documents are, and then how robust the entire purpose is. Um, and see, and just kind of get a, a natural intuition of whether or not this will be able to produce um, results that are meaningful to you. And if all else fails, try it. Try it and see, and see what it produces. And if you knowing what you're working with, um, if that doesn't make sense to you, then you probably either have to tweak the parameters or you might need more data. Uh, can you do something like uh, transfer learning? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, can you do something like transfer learning on this, where you train the model on, uh, say, for example, Wikipedia and then? use it for your data? Um, you can. Um, I've definitely seen um, some papers and articles on that. Um, but I think you just have to make sure that it's a robust um, Wikipedia article. Um, and so like, if it's really concentrating on a certain type of jargon and only has like a limited amount of um, words to trade it on, um, this will, that might affect like how accurate it could predict it for like another um, purpose. But yeah, you totally can. Um, a lot of times I think there's like a New York Times set, um, which when you're learning how to do this or um, some of the tutorials may like take you through that. Um, it's online, you can look at it. Yeah. Um, Instead of treating the document as a bag of words, do you think it would make sense to extract the subject of each sentence and feed those into an LDA algorithm? So, so instead of like looking at, you can, so if you wanted to, so essentially you're extracting the subject. So I guess um, I, I'm confused because the subject would be the topic, right? So in this I'm, case. Well, what I'm thinking of is if you use some um, natural language processing toolkit to take each sentence and figure out the subject of the sentence, mm -hmm. and Long instead traces? of Long traces, yeah, the, the subject of the sentence would be the noun, mm -hmm. and instead of putting the whole document into the LDA algorithm, just take the subject of each sentence and put that into the LDA algorithm. Um, you can. What is what is your intuition behind why that would um, yield a better result? Because I was, I was thinking that the subject of the sentence would be kind of like the most important thing that the sentence is about, and so if you took the, an LDA algorithm of the subject of each sentence in the document, I mean, I'm no expert, I'm just taking a wild guess, I'm just yeah. wondering if that might um, contain more information, or I mean, if, do people do that? I mean, I'm just wondering. Yeah, and um, that'd be, it, I feel like um, that would definitely be interesting to explore, but I think um, a lot of times with LDA, um, 
you're trying to get the topic, which is kind of like the overall gist or subject of the sentence. Um, and so like what it what what LDA does is that it looks at like all of these different sentences um, and it tries to figure out based on the words that the sentence is comprised of, what is the subject of the sentence. Um, so it's, it's trying to figure out like what is the, the topic or the overall gist of it. Now if, if you're saying only concentrating Well I thought LDA was you, you have a document with multiple sentences. Mm -hmm. So what I'm thinking of is instead of taking a document with multiple sentences and just treating each word as a completely independent thing, mm -hmm. take each sentence, pull out the subject, and use the subject of each sentence to figure out what that document is about. Yeah, and so that's definitely something that I guess can be done. Um, it is, um, yeah, I mean, I've seen like a couple of approaches where they don't use back of words um, and like kind of treat everything um, separately. And so maybe that definitely can be done. Um, it just wasn't the approach that I took this time. But that'd be an interesting avenue to explore, for sure. Yeah. Um, coming up with topic labels can be kind of tricky. Can you uh, take like one example from the visualization and just kind of go through your conclusion? Yeah, for sure. Um, let's see. Okay, so based on this, right, um, just from my intuition, because like I said, I am a product analyst, and, and the way that we do product analytics, at least at Square, is that we embed our product analysts into the product so that they can really be um, owners of all things data and analytics for the product. Um, but it also is a great way for them to get um, natural intuition about like some of the um, pros and cons of the product and the short, um, shortcomings. Um, so when I looked at this, um, so service, um, just thank you, use time, season, feature, now, please. Um, so based on those top words, um, what I get from this is that um, this topic is talking about some of these people are seasonal, um, and seasonality is like one of the reasons why they churn. Um, some of it, it, it could be a combination. Um, it seems like in this topic there was a lot of combination of people who um, they said that, you know, I would really like to use it, I just can't use it now because um, the, you know, for this feature, I only need, I only need this feature for this per particular time <clears throat> or something of the sort. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's a little a mix of that and just like from my intuition of knowing the product, I know that those words kind of go into it and to, um, I guess, to make sure that my intuition is correct, um, I have this output at the bottom um, that pretty much um, will assign, like say if I only wanted to look at one churn reason, I'll assign to this, I'll export it to a CSV, and I'll check to make sure that my intuition is right. So I'll look at that, I'll look at like all the actual churn reasons that would have been categorized there and say, does this make sense? Um, it's not gonna be perfect. There's definitely gonna be some that aren't necessarily the best fit, um, but it, it's useful in giving our product managers kind of a sense of what's going on. Yeah, good question. My question is actually related to this one. Uh, yeah. The number of topics that you set the parameter in the model seems yeah. uh, very much related to this. Do you start low, do you start high, do you have a prior on where you start? Yeah, um, and just from knowing, it's also, for me, I start a little bit higher and then I like work my way down. I just, I really like um, elimination. That's like a lot of my techniques, especially even with machine learning. Um, just, um, but yeah, um, knowing the product and knowing I guess I could slice and dice it into a lot of different things, but how useful would that be to my um, to my product manager to have like 40 different topics of why people are churning? Um, so I kind of knew that anything maybe 20 or below um, would probably be, be um, granular enough to get them a detail of what's going on, but not too granular where it's kind of lumping things together. Um, so I started with 20. Um, the bigger topics were great. Some of the smaller ones didn't really make sense. Um, or uh, yeah, they didn't really make sense. <laughs> um, so then I, I went from 20 and kind of like worked my way down. Um, but there's also um, a really good paper um, by, I want to say Color. Um, let me see. Can I include that up here? Um, give me one second. Mm, yeah, callback Leibler diversion score tells you um, if you look at that up, um, it'll be a good way to see how to find the optimal number of topics for. <coughs> Your, your corpus and your model. So, before you look, look that up. Yeah. As a product analyst, I'm sure you have kind of a preset uh, uh, kind of classes of types of things that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, what's the pros and cons of using unsupervised versus supervised learning? Um, um, if, if you kind of know what you're looking for before you, you uh, 
kind of set out to look for like the different types of issues that you know might occur? Yeah, so there are, um, and that's a good question, but I guess for the data that I'm dealing with here, um, I do, even though I generally do know that the types of issues that I am looking for, um, because of the way that our data is, um, they're, they're, they're not matched. Um, so all of our data is just like free, te free text, and um, even though I do know, let's say the output for instance, um, I don't have the output labeled right now in, in our database. Um, so first step could be labeling the output using LDA, and then second step could be like once we have a matched input and output, then we can use some type of supervised learning um, for future cases. Um, but that's, that's a good step. Um, that's a good, good question, for sure. In the back. Um, so how does like uh, LDA compare to using non-negative matrix factorization, or do you think that that has the same, MMF has the same problems that LSI has in terms of like, uh, like not regularizing it? Yeah, and so um, like I mentioned, let me see if I can can pull this up. Um, so Scikit-Learn um, has a really good example. Um, let me see, LDA of um, LDA using non. Uh, yeah, I could like put up the I think I have a link to it in my presentation. Give me one second. So yeah, so second line has a really good example of topic extraction with non-negative matrix factorization and like your like, allocation. Um, I personally have not gone through this um, as of yet to personally be able to tell like which one was better for my needs. Um, based on um, some of the articles that I've read, um, I think Jensen was a good first step, like getting a basic understanding of like what's going on with my data. Um, Jensen seemed to be really good for that. Um, trying to get more nuanced understandings, um, a lot of people refer to this as like a next step. Um, but yeah, I would implore, this is, um, I have a link to it in my presentation, you can take a look, um, see, what they're, see what's going on with top extraction with non-negative matrix factorization um, and LDA, um, and really compare the, compare the outputs. Um, from what I've read, like it, it, it varies depending on what your your corpus, what your corpus looks like that you're treating it, um, but also like the output that you desire. So, I implore you to test it out. Cool. Yeah. Any study that we talked about the topic, but have you ever tried LDA on different languages than English? Um, I have not tried it on different languages than English, um, probably only because the only language that I know is Italian. Um, and I'm sure they have stop words in Italian, so I'm sure that they can, um, you can definitely do that. Maybe that might be a good question for Antonio when he talks about nat natural language processing and he can tell you about how that works in different languages. Um, I have not tried it. Most of the churn releases that I've been analyzing have been in English, though. So that's a good question. Um, but I do know that there are natural language processing tools for other languages, so I wouldn't say that it's impossible. I just wouldn't be able to okay. tell the topics once they're, they're, they're there. Yeah. Are there any kind of uh, topic modeling applications out there, APIs, where you don't have to go out and take all these pieces of the puzzles and put them together? Uh, more of a, that someone else that kind of puts that all together and you can upload your documents? Mm, you know, I wish I'll. <laughs> I wish there were, if, if you could make a perfect package like that, like I think everyone in here would love you forever. Um, but what I, I and I, I do understand what you're saying, like Psychic Learn does a really good job of like trying to collate like a lot of things together. Um, right now with Jensen, they have a lot of really cool tools. Um, uh, I don't think that um, you have one place where you can do it all. I haven't seen um, a package that pretty much has it all. Um, if you do use Scikit-Learn, um, you might be able to just get away with using, you know, like importing a couple of modules and, and using those. But um, yeah, sorry. Those are the two major ones that I could really recommend. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for your attention.